thing to get access to a plaintiff's um, username, password, um, old posts, that sort of thing, to, to um, see if, if the plaintiff's claims can be contradicted. Um, oh, I'm so injured, I can't travel, I can't ride my bike, and you know, then they see a picture of them bungee jumping online or something, and so they want to see more. And, um, so, some additional cases. Um, one of the arguments that is commonly posited um, about reasonable expectations of privacy on social networking sites is that sites, especially sites like Facebook, allow users to restrict who can see the information that they post. You go in and you change your privacy settings and you say only, friend, only my friends can access this information. Um, typically courts are saying that disclosure to some is, is the same as disclosure to all. The purposes of these social networking sites is to network. It's to share information. It's not to keep things um, secret. And it's not necessarily to even keep things generally private. Sharing information is sharing information. And short of sharing it with a privileged, um, a privileged individual, it's, it's shared. It's out. It is, it is out in the open. Um, scholars are arguing to the contrary. Uh, Professor Zimmer, who is at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, actually wrote an article in response to the Harvard study that I was talking about um, saying that this type of data mining on these social networking sites is a problem because the way that the researchers in the Harvard study got access to the information was um, by hiring research assistants who were in the class who already had access to the Facebook pages of um, their classmates because they were in the same class. Um, and that was, the, that was um, one of the primary ways that they were able to get access to the information. Um, and he thought that that was a problem. And that's not to say that there isn't any ethical question about doing research in that, in that way. But, this is, but what, what we're talking about here is a regulatory issue. Um, and whether or not IRBs that are charged with reviewing human subjects research are responsible for reviewing this research. So I mean, there are certainly ethical considerations, but the issue is whether there are regulatory ones. Um, the court in, in the Moreno case actually um, dealt with a posting on a public MySpace page, and they said no, no reasonable expectation of privacy. But the court did allow for the possibility that disclosure to a small group um, with restricted privacy settings could mean that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, but it wasn't what was at issue. So it's really sort of unclear um, whether courts may change direction, but it doesn't appear so. Um, and so with respect to human subjects research, I think that this is, this is um, one way to look at um, the regulations that have been the same since 1981 um, and since reasonable expectations of privacy have changed since then. Um, we need to be looking at privacy in, in a new light and, and in light of um, the new uses of the internet that are being made. Um, in particular, there's a new kind of social networking site um, Patients Like Me is a really, really interesting site. It's specifically designed for people to post their own health information, um, for them to view health information about others, to learn more about the, their diseases, more about their conditions, um, more about the drugs, and I'm talking about medications, legal drugs, um, that they may be taking. What's different about this site compared to Facebook is that um, it restricts who can register. So unlike Facebook, where anybody with an email address who is theoretically over the age of 13 can get a username, um, patients like me actually says that you have to be a patient um, or a family member of a patient, or um, they allow healthcare practitioners. They also allow academic researchers. There's no restriction on academic researchers, but it is a site that restricts users. So there's kind of this push and pull as far as what the reasonable expectations of privacy, I think, might be on a site like this as compared to a site like Facebook where it's open to anybody and that's pretty obvious based on the terms of use and, and privacy poli policies and that sort of thing. Um, but patients like me is pretty clear that it's a more restricted group that's permitted on here. Um, now that said, of course, because academic researchers are allowed on the site, there's no prohibition against them, there's no commentary on whether or not they have to get permission from the site to mine the data. Um, and furthermore, employees of patients like me um, are doing a ton of research with the information that's being posted on their website. Um, 
I did a, a PubMed search of patients like me and got 19 results, and I believe 15 of them included one author who was actually an employee of patients like me. So they are mining their own data. And they are saying in their publications, um, there was one publication in particular where um, the individual from patients like me who wrote the article said that people join expecting that they're going to participate in research. So, you know, given that there are no regulations on these uses of the internet and there is no guidance, I, I think means that HHS really needs to take a new look at what private information is and what it is specifically in, in the context of internet research. Um, and really now is the time to do it. Uh, HHS is well aware of the new uses of the internet to conduct research. Um, back in July of 2010, the Secretary's Committee um, had a presentation. Uh, Professor Zimmer was actually part of um, the group making the presentation to the Secretary's Advisory Committee um, on internet research issues and the privacy implications that are involved. Um, in July of 2011, so just a few months ago, there was an advance notice of proposed rulemaking that was published. And this was big, big news in um, the human subjects research community um, because it's the first time that the government is, has really looked at making a major change to the regulations in a very, very, very long time. Um, and there was an acknowledgement of changes in technology and uses of the internet um, that I think that this is the opening to um, possibly consider making changes, if not specifically to the regulatory provisions, then at a minimum through guidance. Um, so that said, um, I think that looking at issues like survey research, um, survey research, again, I come back to, is human subjects research. It's an, inter it's an interaction. It's um, collection of private information. Um, and therefore requires informed consent. It has to meet all of the other criteria that human subjects research must meet. Um, as far as recruitment goes, there is one guidance document that is published, it's online, the Office for Human Research Protections, which is the office that um, interprets and enforces 45 CFR 46, um, has, has guidance available that says for clinical trial websites, which are websites where um, it's essentially like a directory listing um, of clinical trials, and it's specifically for, they are specifically for clinical trials. Um, OHRP has said what type of information actually needs to be reviewed by IRBs if researchers are going to advertise on these types of websites. Well, I think that one way that the government may need to look at um, changing its, its views is to consider revising that document and making it applicable to recruitment on all websites. I think it'll do a couple of things. One is um, right now IRBs are reviewing all recruitment information, um, for example, flyers that may be posted on bulletin boards and that sort of thing. So um, if, you know, if, if there's information beyond basic information posted on any website, um, beyond just clinical trial websites. I think it ensures the protection of, of human subjects, but I think that it also um, potentially alleviates unnecessary review of basic information that may be published on other websites, like Facebook, for example, which is not a clinical trial website. Um, as far as mining data, I think that it's not human subjects research. Um, one, one of the common uh, arguments that's made is that uh, if a site is protected by a password, that that brings up possibly reasonable expectations of privacy on the part of the site users. And I'm not so sure that that is actually um, the best argument. Um, because I'm not sure that a password on a site like Facebook does much of anything besides um, preventing somebody, if you've got a Facebook password, you know, nobody can go in and change the information that you post or change your <coughs> privacy settings. But the fact that there's a password, if anybody can get one, doesn't really mean much. Um, but I think the hook is really on um, a site like Patients Like Me where there are restrictions on who can register on the site and having to certify that your purpose is actually your true purpose. I mean, I think that that potentially raises the, the expectations of privacy that people can have on, on a website like that. Um, so I think that those are really the considerations that HHS needs to make. Um, I think that the second that researchers start using spyware or um, hacking or um, deception, friending people on Facebook in an effort to be able to view their information but without full disclosure, um, I think those are issues where 
the line of an expectation of privacy may be crossed, and we're getting into human subjects research in IRB territory. So um, just kind of in summary, um, thank you. <laughs>